Okay, um, so today I'll be uh, talking about just giving an introduction and kind of overview as to what cryptocurrencies are, what blockchains are, just what kinds of things you can do on blockchains other than cryptocurrencies, and also more generally kind of why I find them interesting in both an academic and a, and a social sense. Uh, so first of all, you know, what's in a blockchain, right? So and I'm sure a lot of people have seen kind of pretty diagrams like this one before. A blockchain is a chain of blocks. That was so hard to, to figure out. Uh, so basically the idea is that it, it's this data structure that keeps track of a history of just things of some kinds that people want to kind of collectively keep track of, right? So the you know, originally you know, motivating use case for blockchains was uh, Bitcoin, this uh, peer-to-peer digital currency that was launched at the beginning of 2009. Um, and the problem that um, like uh, people were trying to solve with uh, launching a peer-to-peer -to -peer digital currency was this thing called the double spending problem, right? So with there was this uh, kind of cypherpunk movement that so uh, keep kept on wanting to kind of create decentralized and kind of central authority independent versions of things and for something like file sharing well you can do it people can kind of send files to each other over the internet for encrypted messaging you can do it people can kind of send messages to each other over the internet turns out currency is kind of harder and the reason why is this uh, ch uh, challenge called the double spending problem Right, so the double spending problem basically says, suppose I have a digital record, kind of speaking very abstractly, that says I have 100 coins. And suppose I send uh, those 100 coins to one, to one person, and I create w whatever kind of set of messages I need to create to authorize that transfer. Now suppose I create the exact same set of messages of, except authorizing a transfer to another person. So now one person has what looks like enough of a, a sufficient proof to get 100 coins, and another person also has what looks like a sufficient proof to get 100 coins. So I've turned 100 coins into 200 coins. Yay, free money, a communist utopia. Except like, in reality, we know, we know that would just lead to hyperinflation. So the problem basically is how, like, how do you create a currency where you can't just copy money as much as you want, right? Because information is just so easy to copy. How do you make a information-based currency that you can't copy? And the um, approach that uh, Bitcoin ended up taking is basically that you have this uh, decentralized network consisting of this large number of computers, and for a transaction to be valid, it doesn't just have to be uh, a message sent from me to you, it also has to be broadcast onto the network and it has to be kind of accepted by the network. Now, who is the network? What, what, what computers are we talking about? You know, if uh, I send a transaction to A and a transaction to B at the same time up to the network, how does it decide whether to pick one or the other? And the, um, so there's actually two problems that are, um, um, that are in here, right? So one of those problems is this problem of decentralized consensus. And the other problem is this uh, problem of how do we even kind of measure participation rights in a fully open network, right? Like you could say, oh, instead of having one server, we're gonna have 10 servers and maybe seven of them have to agree. And then we'll do some layer on, layers on top to make sure like seven of them actually end up agreeing on something and resolving kind of splits between five and five. But, but then you still have to choose, well, who are the 10 servers? And well, what if there's no one who's willing to run those 10 servers at the beginning? What if people still don't trust those 10 servers? You know, companies collude all the time. You know, there's, you, know, you have the LIBOR scandal, you have like lot, just lots of instances of collusion everywhere. Like, how do you prevent it? So the solution that Satoshi came up with is basically that in, you create the system where just literally anyone can participate in the network. Ah, but if anyone can participate in the network, then what if, I join the network and I pretend to create one billion fake virtual machines and then I pre pretend that these one billion fake virtual machines are legitimate computers on the network, right? And then I act like part of the network and I have this kind of big overwhelming control over the network and I just unilaterally decide what transactions the network code agrees on. So to prevent this, the uh, Bitcoin used proof of work, right? So proof of work basically means that 
for a, in order to measure the extent of one uh, node's right to participate in the network, you basically measure how much computing power they have. And how do you measure how much computing power they have? Well, you basically have require all of these nodes to be just constantly uh, solving these mathematical puzzles 24-7. And like basically, how many solutions you can crank out kind of dictates what your level of participation is in the network. And so if I send a transaction to some one person, and then I want to do what's called a double spending fraud and like basically take the money back by, say, sending a trans uh, another transaction to myself, then uh, in order for me to be able to actually revert the consensus, I would need to have more computing power than the rest of the network put together. And so this is kind of the core underpinning of this uh, uh, Bitcoin system. So basically, each one of these blocks, in order for it to be considered a valid block, it has to have one of these kind of mathematical puzzle solutions attached to it. And a block gets built, kind of points to a previous block, and so you have this chain of blocks that just keeps on growing over time. And you might ask, well, what if there's a disagreement? What if there's two my, uh, people that build uh, two blocks on top of the same uh, the same block? Well, eventually someone's going to build on top of one of them, and if there's a conflict, the chain that's the longest chain wins. So this is one of the, uh, this is kind of very early idea, and you know, since then it's led to a $100 billion cryptocurrency. So what kind of properties do we want? Um, like why do we just want to do all of these things, right? So first of all, like people wanted to have this property of full decentralization, so no dependence on specific central authorities. And like basically, the reason why you want to avoid central authorities is, well, before Bitcoin, you had centralized digital cash. You had like PayPal. And PayPal, well, what did they do? They started charging high fees. They started charging even higher fees if the payment was international. They started uh, blocking people's accounts if they, if they uh, didn't like them. In many cases, even if they were perfectly legal, they uh, started uh, doing a bunch of things that lots of people didn't like. And so you know, it, the goal was that instead of trying to kind of spin up a competitor to PayPal and hoping that the people running it are nice next time, well, you make a system that doesn't require one particular group of people to be nice. And instead, you, you know, try to kind of maximally rely on economic incentives. Uh, fully open, so you want a system where anyone can participate as a transaction sender, as a transaction receiver, as a miner, so like as a participant in this consensus, so in any of these roles. Um, anyone can participate on equal terms, no privileged parties. Um, censorship resistance, so it's extremely difficult to stop transactions from getting included into the chain. And it's expected to just keep running as long as there exists at least someone who's running these mathematical puzzles and cranking out new Bitcoin blocks. So this is an interesting uh, technology um, because it integrates multiple categories of technologies and ideas. So one of them is just bas basically distributed consensus. Now, you can kind of argue that Bitcoin proof of work is a kind of consensus algorithm in the kind of formal definition of the term if you kind of add a couple of layers on top of it and people have sort of written papers about it. But like most fundamentally, it just means getting different nodes in a network to, to agree on things, even if there's network latency, even if some of the nodes are actively trying to break the protocol. Now, but then distributed consensus by itself is something that we've had in different forms since the 1980s. So the next, um, so that's not the only thing, right? So the next thing is that we have proof of work as economic civil resistance. So this is this idea that you use like, measuring a computer's uh, ability to solve these mathematical puzzles as a way of distinguishing kind of quote real participants from like uh, me trying to make a billion virtual fake virtual machines. And then there's also this uh, self-reinforcing economic incentive property, right? So Bitcoin kind of uses game theory at its core in many ways. And the way that it does this is that if you make a block that makes it into the chain, then you have a, uh, uh, you get a block reward of 12 and a half Bitcoins. And if you create a block that is not part of the chain, then you do not get a reward. And you wasted a lot of money solving these mathematical puzzles. So 
it basically the idea is that if you expect most of the other participants in the network to be honest, then it's your incentive to kind of build on top of the chain so that you actually get these rewards. And why is everyone else going to be honest? Because they're also building on top of the chain because they want to seek these rewards. So it's this really nice kind of recursive structure where everyone's incentive is to be, is to be honest as long as most of the others participate honestly. And in order for, the, for Bitcoin, the currency, to have value, it has to sit on top of a protocol that's secure. And why is there incentive to help make the protocol secure? Because the currency has value. So it's this kind of circular sort of chain of a set of things that all kind of feed into each other in this wonderful positive feedback loop. And it's successfully kept the thing running for 10 years. So what kinds of uh, problems has it solved, right? So, First of all, one of its major goals is to just be decentralized. And distributed consensus as a field, so this idea that you have like five or 10 computers and let's get them to send messages to each other so that they all agree on something, even if some of the participants, maybe up to a third of them, are trying to actively subvert the network. This is something that people have written papers about since the 1980s. Um, the first one is from Leslie Lamport in 1982. Um, the, the work has since then been kind of expanded into fully fledged consensus algorithms, things like PBFT. Now you might ask, well, why do you need like proof of work? Why not use these algorithms? And it's because, well, these algorithms all have this implicit model that you know that there exists these specific 10 computers, right? And in this sort of fully open and permissionless setting, there does not exist, you know, even a, a list of 10 computers that we all trust. And so instead, well, we have to use proof of work. So important goal, really be decentralized. So you have this kind of, uh, the main challenges of this, one of them is what I call this kind of weight assignment problem, which is basically says, given some set of actors, how do we assign them weights? So how do we say, I have like 1% of the network, you have 0.5% of the network, he has 0.5% of the network, she has 0.7%. and Cryptographic protocols that don't have access to kind of roots of trust, legal identity, whatever, so anyone can create as many accounts as they want. And so you can solve this problem basically only with economics, right? So basically, in proof of work, the quantity of these kind of ma expensive mathematical puzzle solutions that you come up with basically determines your level of participation in the system. And in proof of stake, which is this kind of newer and potentially more efficient paradigm, the number of coins you have inside of the system is this economically limiting resource that determines your kind of level of participation in the network consensus. And then there's also the incentive problem. How do we encourage people to participate instead of not participating and participate honestly instead of participating in some malicious way? So proof of work uses economic tools to, to solve both of these challenges. So this is Bitcoin, right? And, but, and Bitcoin's run well, you know, it's uh, run for 10 years, it's only broken one, like twice, it's only almost broken, like maybe, maybe once, it's processed a bunch of transactions, uh, the price is up to about $4,000, yay. Um, but as the saying goes, right, cryptocurrency is only the first app. So in, around maybe 2013, uh, when people re started realizing that, you know, hey, this Bitcoin thing works, this blockchain thing is interesting. Wait, this blockchain thing. Maybe this blockchain thing, this kind of decentralized consensus mechanism, is useful for more things than just Bitcoin. Hmm. And so there started to be this kind of set of, uh, pro of projects that were trying to expands the capabilities of a blockchain to beyond just a cryptocurrency, right? There were, well, probably the, first, the second blockchain in existence, I I'm not sure, but I believe, was Namecoin, which was trying to use um, a Bitcoin black blockchain to make a decentralized DNS system. Um, then there were projects that were trying to let people issue other assets and use the blockchain to keep track of transfers of other assets. There was one called Covered Coins. There were protocols enabling more and more features. That one, of, one of the big ones was Mastercoin. People were starting these kind of Swiss Army knife blockchains that would support 10 different transaction types for 10 different applications. NXT was a big one at, at the time. And so there was like a lot of interest in just more and more kind of capability. 
And the main idea behind Ethereum is to basically provide all the capability by taking the path of generality, right? So instead of supporting a specific list of applications, Ethereum basically has this built-in programming language and you can write the kind of business logic of any application you want to write in this programming language and the process of executing transactions that get included in the blockchain also runs this computer code and so it helps uh, run your application. So one of the things that people talk about blockchains being useful for is this notion of a smart contract. And so uh, Nick Szabo, one of the um, earliest originator of the term, had this uh, wonderful analogy for a smart contract where he said they were kind of similar to vending machines. And if you think about a vending machine, right, it's basically kind of a set of rules that is enforced by, uh, and kind of given security by physical hardware. Right, so the rules basically say, you put $2 in, water comes out. You don't put $2 in, water does not come out. Simple, right? Now, the purpose of the vending machine is to be this kind of automated physical device that enforces the rules and enforces them like up to some level of security. Right? If you try really hard, you can whack the virtual machine with a hammer and you can uh, do a 51% uh, attack on its orientation and you can kind of you know, orient it flat and then grab as much water as you want um, until, until the police come running, but that's a different security model. But the point of uh, basically vending machines do have realistically kind of enough security for their task and they automate this task and they, aut and they reduce the need for like basically trusting human and like relying on human intermediaries. So a, a smart contract on a blockchain kind of is a digital equivalent of this, right? It's a computer program that directly controls ownership of digital assets and has the right to distribute them according to some pre-specified set of rules. So one simple example of this is um, two out of three escrow. So the idea basically is, um, let's suppose that you have a, um, a system where I have a phone and I want to sell you this phone for, let's say, one Bitcoin, because you want to pay $4,000 for a phone for some reason. Actually, not one, not one Bitcoin. It's, this is on Ethereum, one Ether. So now it's cheap. The, <laughs> so well, here is what you do, right? So you, first of all, you can initialize the contract. And when we initialize the contract, we have me, the buyer, we, or, or me, the seller. We have you, the buyer and we'll appoint some third party to be the arbitrator, right? So this is kind of like eBay arbitration. Except the improvement that we're going to go after is that we don't trust any one of these three parties completely. We only, like the only way in which this uh, system can break is if two out of three parties both kind of act incorrectly or maliciously in some way. So step one, we call the init function and um, we, um, you call the init function, and so the, the buyer parameter of this uh, program, so these are persistent variables, gets set to like basically whoever sent the transaction. The seller parameter gets sent to um, be this um, argument of the, con of the uh, smart contract, so in this case it would be me, and the arbitrated, uh, arbitrator would be set to just some other third party, right? So, I don't know, let's say like this water bottle is the arbitrator. So, the, um, there's, so what's going to happen is when you start the process of buying the phone, you're going to call init, and then you're going to send one ether into the smart contract. Now, after that, there's, two, there's a few possible things that can happen. Right? So the normal workflow is I take the phone, I ship it over to you, you receive it, and you are happy. And then to express your sheer joy and happiness of receive, at successfully receiving the product, you call the finalize function. And the finalize function says, oh, if who, the person calling the function is the buyer, then you basically send the money inside of the smart contract um, the, um, to the seller, which is me. So I get the money, the contract doesn't have money anymore, and you can throw it away, and you're done. Yay. Now let's look at some less happy paths, right? So that's the happy path. So one less happy path is I decide just I'm going to change my mind. I, li I love this phone. It's a great phone. And I'm not going to sell it to you for one ETH. And so I am going to call the refund function. 
and refund says if the seller, if the message says sender is the seller, then send the money back to the buyer. And so it'll just give you your money back. Now let's suppose I don't give you my phone and I also want your ether. Now what's gonna happen? Well, clearly you are not going to call finalize because you didn't get your phone. I'm not gonna call refunds because I'm a greedy jerk. And you cannot, you, no, I can't call finalize and you can't call refunds because the code doesn't let you. And so instead we have to rely on the arbiter. Right? And so both of these functions can be called by the arbiter. So the arbiter comes in and he's like, hey, where's the phone man? And you know, if, um, I had, if I still have the phone, then he's going to call a refund. And if uh, the buyer actually has the phone, then the arbiter is going to call finalize. Now, if the arbiter is malicious, then notice that the only power the arbiter has, the ar arbiter can't just control the money themselves. The arbiter can only send it back to the buyer or send it to the seller. So if the arbiter is dishonest, but the buyer or the seller are honest, then the buyer can just, t if the buyer gets the money, the buyer can just voluntarily send it to the seller. If the seller gets the money and, and is honest and wants to refund, the seller can just send it to the buyer. So in any of these cases, like you need two out of three parties to both be, mal be malicious in order for this protocol to not work, right? So this is just sort of one example of how you can use smart contracts to get security guarantees that would not be possible without those smart contracts. So there's more complex examples that you can do with them. So this is a kind of somewhat more complicated involved application. Uh, this is something called Uniswap. And the way that Uniswap works is it's a kind of on blockchain decentralized exchange. So it's this uh, smart contract where the smart contract holds two different kinds of assets. One of them might be ETH and another might be some other cryptocurrency. So in this case, we call them A tokens and B tokens. And the way that the exchange works is it basically, it holds some quantity of tokens, A tokens, some quantity of B tokens, and the smart contract code maintains this hard invariant that the quantity of A that the exchange ho contract holds multiplied by the quantity of B that the exchange holds equals some constant K. And this like hyper hyperbola is the X, Y equals K curve. So let's say I have A tokens and I want to convert them into B tokens. What do I do? Well, based kind of mathematically speaking, you can think of it as, well, I just specify a different point on the X, Y equals K curve that I want the contract to be, right? So before the contract had this much A and this much B, I want the contract to have more A and less B. And so I'm going to cover the difference in A, and the B and the um, X, the B tokens that the exchange loses go to me, right? And so I'm giving it A, and um, I'm getting B, and in the process I'm also kind of bumping up the price, right? So you can look at the kind of the implicit derivative of the curve as basically just being the price of A versus B, and as more people buy A, the price go uh, the price goes up, and A gets more expensive. As more people buy B, the price go uh, of B goes up, and B becomes more expensive. So this, so this thing is actually running right now, and it's in terms of like the amount of, um, of money locked in Ethereum applications, it's actually the third largest in, uh, on the blockchain. So it has about $7 million of reserves that are locked inside of it. And people just use this as an exchange for, for, for trading assets, and it seems to be working great. So the, you know, well, this is just one example of how you know, smart contracts can be used to just design a whole bunch of really clever and interesting kinds of mechanisms. So why are people interested, right? So there's two kinds of reasons that I think uh, blockchains are interesting. So one of them are the kind of academic reasons. So blockchains are this very kind of pure playground for implementing applications that run on basically economic incentives, experimenting, and seeing the results of the experiments, right? You can just take some, like, write the code for something like Uniswap, test it, deploy it, and people can just start using it. And, you know, you basically, it just runs as pure code, and that's it. Um, there's also a community that has an existing interest in market mechanisms, auctions, applications, just doing all sorts of cool things with 
smart contracts, cryptocurrency is also just non-financial applications of blockchains, like just using them to store data, using them to store information about whether or not some particular key is still valid for some particular account and like, various things like that. And generally, it's just very easy to test and deploy. So there, aside from these kind of academic reasons, um, there are, and you know, the academic reasons have kind of motivated a lot of people. There is like a lot of prediction market enthusiasts that just go into the blockchain space because you can use blockchains to build prediction markets. There's uh, you know, just people it, um, like market design enthusiasts that go into blockchains because you can just build things like Uniswap and you can build things like combinatorial auctions on them. And it's, and it's cool and you can do it. But there's also these uh, social reasons, right? So, um, basically, blockchains let us build this kind of entire class of applications that are not like anything that existed before, right? So something like y even just Uniswap, for example, is just not something that you can build on top of BitTorrent. It's not something that you can build on top of, you know, like off the record messaging. It's not something that you can build on top of like secure Scuttlebutt or like any of these other protocols. It just, it requires globally shared state. And globally shared state is a strictly more powerful primitive, but on the other hand, there are, there are things that you pay in order to get it, right? They're like, you have, it's more expensive, you have to get this global consensus, you have higher latency. So there is this entire class of applications that, not, not nearly all applications, there's lots of things you can do without blockchains, but there is this entire new class of things that you just can do if you have the decentralized globally shared state. Kind of digital institutions with no central coordinator that are not kind of focused in any single jurisdiction. So they're one of the kind of buzzwords that a lot of people are excited about is this idea of uh, decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. And people are interested in this concept of, you know, hey, can we use DAOs as kind of a better way for people to organize, possibly as a replacement for companies and things like that. Um, smart contracts as a kind of special purpose quote legal systems that has very low enforcement costs in some cases. So in those cases where you can just very easily measure whether or not some particular event happened and you can just automatically do things based on those events, then smart contracts are just this easy and kind of low trust way to implement many kinds of things, right? So it's like there's applications that are kind of very purely smart contract friendly. So for example, if I want to give someone a bounty for factoring some RSA key, then I can just write those rules as a smart contract and people can just freely go ahead and like try to claim the bounty. If um, Now you can go a bit further and you can say, well, what about applications that depend on data in the real world? Well, in that case, you one of the things that you can do is you, you do need to have data feed providers that basically take data from the outside world and sort of push it into the blockchain or at least digitally sign it so you can verify it on the blockchain, but you don't need to trust a single one, right? So you can have a smart contract that says, we're gonna take these nine data feed providers and we're gonna take the median of them. And so the contract is going to give an okay result as long as at least five of them are honest. And this is, um, you know, still, like, and this is something that people are starting to do, right? So for example, Maker, which is a project that uses smart contracts to create a price stabilized cryptocurrency on top of the Ethereum blockchain, it actually has 14 price feeds that it takes the median of in order to kind of calculate the um, ETH to dollar exchange rate that it then uses to kind of target the, pr the, the price of, of the DAI, which is its price stable cryptocurrency. Um, so. Also, like smart contracts for just very, very small things like in insurance agreements, um, certain kinds of financial agreements, just lots of small things in those particular cases where they're relatively easy to measure, you can use smart contracts for them. Um, more kind of open, free, and inclusive alternatives to centralized applications and platform monopolies. So this is a very big one. So basically, the idea here is that if you have a many different small companies in some industry and they want to kind of interoperate more, then sometimes messaging isn't just, and having common messaging standards is enough for that. But sometimes interoperability also requires sharing state. And if you want to share state, 
then you need to have like some kind of platform that lets you have this kind of globally shared um, state that you can remember. And so you can have applications where sort of many smaller providers in the same industry all kind of build on top of the same platform and they get a lot of the same kind of network effect benefits that they would get if they were one company without the risks of having a big super powerful monopoly. And like this is like a pitch that I'm, people in the gaming industry in some cases are trying to do. There's people that are trying to do this for different kinds of financial technologies and like many other kinds of things, right? So just in general, more, like, just for like many kinds of applications that are currently kind of centralized monopolies, you can sometimes use blockchains to create an alternative where like even if there are points of centralization, there's kind of more of them and individual users can more easily kind of choo uh, uh, choose and move between them. And finally, a community that's uh, excited about just using technology for a positive social transformation. So applications, um, I talk Augur, there's the prediction market, Maker, this kind of decentralized price stable cryptocurrency. Um, this is, I believe, um, Hurricane Guard, and then this is, um, you can actually play Gomoku on the blockchain, um, for, uh, for Ether on the blockchain. And this is actually not even on the blockchain. This is actually using a, scale, a scalability technology called state channels. So it's like technologically under the hood, insanely cool, and, but you can do it and, and you can play Gomoku and yay, it's fine. Um, Non-financial applications are also important. So blockchains can be used as kind of quote, proof of inexistence. So cryptography can prove often enough that things happened, but blockchains can prove that things did not happen, that some action of a certain type has not yet been taken because you can just scan the blockchain and you can verify that, wait, there actually is no record of a particular type that has happened yet. And this is useful, for example, for decentralized identity management. So if you have an identity, that identity has some cryptographic keys that you use to sign messages, and you want to just store the information that you revoke a key and that key is not valid anymore, then you can do that. And you can have a kind of smart contract on a blockchain whose sole purpose is to just store the, the variable which public key currently has the right to represent me. And that key can change over time, you can have rules for how that key can change, and you can have rules for how to change those rules, and you can implement all of that logic in there. Um, attestations about individuals and organizations. So things that, can, things that might need to be revoked. So university degrees, maybe citizenship, maybe certain kinds, just various kinds of records, various kinds of registries. Um, just ultra high value data store. So very small pieces of information, possibly even just things like keys that you want to be really, really sure will be publicly accessible in any years. So there are cases where like, there are many kind, certain kinds of protocols that actually do kind of depend on just cr generating information in the process where you do just want the information to be as publicly accessible and available after, a, uh, after some really long time in the future. Right? So um, proof of process integrity, so like, for example, if you have a mechanism like an auction, for example, then you can use this to verify that someone got a chance to participate in some mechanism. And you can verify that people did not get unfairly censored because participating on a, on, in the mechanism would have just required uh, publishing transactions to the blockchain. And the result of the mechanism can be provably kind of calculated as a computation of all the messages that were published to the blockchain. So, Preventing kind of fraud via censorship. Uh, so prevent, and censorship, like a lot of people think of the word as kind of most, a, a lot of the time as meaning like be preventing people from talking about stuff and like resisting that kind of censorship is definitely valuable. But then there's also this much broader category of censorship, like for example, censoring people's orders in, mar in like markets and like exchange order books could be a way to cheat them or, or front run them and like basically extract money or extra fees from them. So there's plenty of cases where you just have mechanisms of different kinds where you want to be able to have this strong guarantee that people got a fair chance to participate that, that you cannot block. And that's an example of things that blockchains can do. So takeaways. Um, 
they mainly, and first of all, blockchains are not just uh, about uh, cryptocurrency, right? So you can use uh, blockchains to do things like smart contracts. You can build many different kinds of applications on top of them. And this isn't just theoretical, right? So here's this uh, really wonderful tutorial from ADAP University. There's um, also kind of online web compilers for some of the programming languages that you would use to write uh, smart contracts in Ethereum. And you can just go ahead and like, try to just build a simple blockchain-based application that does something, see, uh, deploy it, try using it, see how it works. And that's just one good way of uh, sort of learning your way around the platform, right? So if you're interested, then you know, go, build, go build something and enjoy. Um, and uh, you know, like otherwise, there's also plenty of, kind of other materials on the, um, on the internet to um, learn about a lot of this stuff. And you know, there's a lot of these kind of technical topics about how do these platforms actually work? How do some of these applications work? And, but generally, you can just kind of look for it and you'll probably find it. So and thank you. And, uh, and if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them too. So my, the question was, if I had to redesign Ethereum from scratch, what would I do differently? So interestingly enough, we kind of are redesigning Ethereum from scratch. So there's this um, effort uh, called uh, Ethereum 2.0, which uh, basically designs this uh, blockchain based on proof of stake and uh, for a more efficient consensus, sharding for more scalability, um, changes the virtual machine from the current EVM to WebAssembly, um, makes a lot of the data structures kind of much more efficient and less sort of awkward. Um, it replaces like hex three Patricia trees with binary trees and, and a bunch of other kind of technical stuff that really increases efficiency. So that effort exists and the first kind of maybe two thirds of it are actually very close to being fully specified. So, and, that, and it's kind of well um, on the way to being implemented. So I'd encourage people to kind of check out the um, ETH 2.0 effort as well. Um, so probably the main kind of, some just random examples of things that we've learned from Ethereum 1 that we've been um, incorporating into um, ETH 2. So first of all, there's just our research on proof of stake consensus that was totally not mature at the time that we did Ethereum 1.0, but that is quite mature and at, the uh, at the time that we're doing Ethereum 2.0 right now. Also our research around scalability through sharding. Um, also, a lot, we've made a lot of kind of subtle decisions that made the protocol unnecessarily complicated. So one example of this is that we have like the, um, the state of the system, so like account balances, code storage, blah, 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 is all stored in this kind of hexary Patricia Merkle tree structure with, that's formatted in this complicated way. And it takes about like 200 lines of code to, like, like even more, maybe like 500 lines of code to actually like process like how to modify the tree, how to verify branches of the tree and other things. And it ended up being about four times, like uh, the individual branches ended up being four times less efficient than they needed to be. And so we ended up lo losing a lot of efficiency because of that. And that's one example of something that we're in the process of uh, reforming for the uh, 2.0 chain. Um, another example is the virtual machine. So like we made this like really custom virtual machine with like 256 bit word sizes and special upgrades for cryptography and things like that. And like to some extent we needed to do that because we had these uh, special requirements. So for example, we needed to be able to count the number of computational steps um, um, in, in a smart contract execution to have some cutoff point to prevent infinite loops and to be able to charge for computational steps. And that's not something that pretty much any existing virtual machine had. Um, we also needed perfect sandboxing and kind of perfect determinism for security reasons. Because if two machines execute the code differently, then like the entire chain kind of falls out of consensus. And we needed like very small code sizes. So that was what motivated the original Ethereum virtual machine design. But then since then, we've done a lot of uh, looking at particularly at WebAssembly. And WebAssembly is this kind of mainstream effort to create a virtual machine, primarily for use in browsers, but also for other use cases. And WebAssembly actually also just 
seems to satisfy most of these properties. So it has a, a reasonably compact code sizes. It's reasonably simple. Um, it's possible to just ban specific opcodes to uh, make it fully deterministic. And it's also like we've already implemented a compiler that takes a WebAssembly code and converts it into like metered WebAssembly code that automatically keeps track of how many computational steps it's taking. So that's uh, the thing that we're looking to use um, inside of Ethereum 2.0. Uh, yes? Mm -hmm. Or in proof of stake, for example, you can have an unfair enforcement clashing somewhere. So sometimes the law is great, right? mm -hmm. like black and white. So you want sometimes to be mm -hmm. able to fix mm -hmm. more contracts. And is this a problem to fix? Yeah, so the question is how do I feel about immutability? Um, and I would say, in general, that relying on kind of extra protocol intervention, so like things like the DAO fork, for example, to just keep on solving every problem is probably a dead end. And the reason is basically that it's like you could do that to resolve like really big emergency cases that affect like extremely large sets of users. But if you try, like, but then that's not scalable and like you can't really make that work for kind of like basically solving like the 10,000 smaller problems that people just right. end up having every day. And so you'll end up with like basically either a blockchain that just ends up having a centralized bureaucracy that keeps on agreeing on like what interventions to make every week or it's just not going to work for everyone except like, the extremely rich. And so I would basically favor just instead doing more layer two work to try to like imp increase security and like if needed have uh, kind of better forms of um, upgrade like upgradability and reversibility in the in the specific cases where people need it. Um, so one example of this might be that in a lot of DAO constructions, like there exists a safety valve where if you have some some set of tokens of the DAO then you have the rights to kind of secede at any time by just withdrawing your share of the tokens. And if we want to increase security of DAOs, then we can standardize that as a component. We can formally verify it as a component. We can do a lot of auditing of that as a component. And we can encourage DAOs to be built, based on, built on top of that. And so if anything goes wrong, then people would be able to kind of weave through that mechanism. Right? So a layer two things like that. And also, there's a lot of work to be done in like user account security, for example, and also just help getting, helping people write more secure contracts in the first place. Um, there's also application-specific ways that you can improve kind of upgradability. So like for example, another kind of approach that you can make if you have a DAO is you could have a rule that says you can change, like some governance mechanism can change the code, but it can only change the code with a 30-day delay. And then if that uh, if the governance gets hacked or gets taken over in some way, then there's a period of time of 30 days in which everyone can kind of exit and stop using the system. So I support more of uh, kind of bu building uh, things like that rather than trying to intervene at layer one because I think these layer two approaches are more scalable. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If financial incentives did not exist, what would be the next best motivator? Um, sure. So one example of an alternative that already exists. So like for example, the Tor network, right? It has some set of exit nodes. And you, like, as a user, would have to just your transaction kind of gets routed through like multiple nodes in the network. It eventually exits through an uh, it eventually goes out to the internet through an exit node. And theoretically, like if an adversary controls like over a, like a, a really really huge percentage of the nodes, then it becomes easier for them to de-anonymize, and so you don't want that to happen. And so the way Tor solves the problem is that like they basically just kind of kind of centrally manage a list and like you can join and you can join the list that is kind of social reputation based. 
I don't know, maybe like you might want to elaborate more on that. <laughs> hmm. It gets banned. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, so the answer is that instead of being a whitelist, it's a blacklist, but it's still a kind of social enforcement. You know, basically, if you don't have economic mechanisms, then some, something like that is pretty much the only way to do it, I would say. Mm, yes? Sure. So I think, like, first of all, one of the big kind of fallacies that a lot of people that are kind of new to the space just accidentally end up believing is they view blockchain as being kind of this big grand ideology that says that all law should be replaced by like smart contracts and code, and every condition of a contract should just become you know, written in like Python or Solidity or whatever. And that's obviously an insanely unrealistic. Um, and so. <clears throat> the viewpoints that I per personally prefer is this kind of analogy that says that instead of this being like a replacement for law, this is more like supercharged digital vending machines. And that's, you know, first of all, that, que well, that clearly does mean that law might still like have a role in dispute resolution because if, like first of all, if a smart contract leads to outcome A, but then according to the law of the jurisdiction, the outcome that should have happened is outcome B, then like technically A has the, like one, the one participant has the right to sue the other for B minus A, and if the laws works, then, then get the money, right? So the existence of a smart contract like doesn't preclude these kind of legal, like extra technical remedies from existing and being, like, Im uh, and being implementable. Um, I would say, so, but even still, you know, trying to figure out the boundaries between and like how uh, smart contracts and legal contracts could interact is definitely one challenge. Um, there's also areas where smart contracts and legal contracts can have a fairly synergistic role. So one example of this is if you want to have a um, smart contract that using the um, that uses, um, say, or say, like, com um, or if you want to, let's say, have just company shares uploaded to the blockchain and turned into a tradable token, then a lot of the things that the trading will be done with will be smart contracts, right? So, like, if let's say we manage to upload like Tesla shares onto the blockchain, then you'll be able to like, trade Tesla shares for Ether using Uniswap or whatever, and those will be smart contracts. But then, in order for those Tesla shares to actually be like have value and actually be backed by like real Tesla shares somewhere in, a, in, in some kind of underlying registry, then you do need the legal work to be done to make sure that kind of mapping actually exists and you're not just trading worthless tokens. So there is a lot of uh, lawyers that are kind of working on building those kinds of bridges too. Uh, yes? Um, first of all, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was wondering uh, your thoughts on how uh, blockchain or cryptocurrency can be used in the developing world. So, like, mm -hmm. is there a way it can kind of replace an otherwise expensive banking infrastructure? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I know there are people interested in do using blockchains for things like land registries and like certain kinds of identity registries and things like that, which is interesting. In the near term, um, there exists this project called Hurricane Guard, which is doing kind of blockchain-based flood insurance. So the idea is it's a smart contract that basically, you know, you, someone buying the insurance puts money in, and if the like, amount of rainfall in some area is above some value, then it just automatically pays you, uh, gives you a bigger payout. And in one of the people um, in the team, I believe, is based in Puerto Rico, and like, they are actually trying to get it adopted in places like Central America. So 
that would be just one example of like just of uh, blockchains being useful, and like there's many other categories of microfinance too. Yes. So one of the examples you see is um, you can blockchain for data use. Mm -hmm. want to be publicly available for a long time. Yes. Mm -hmm. yourself yes. the contract, mm -hmm. the money. At the end of the day, it comes down to storing a private key mm -hmm. for, as you say, a decade. Mm -hmm. Do you think people are up to this task? Do you think the technology is up to this task? Yeah, that's um, a good question. Um, so I definitely don't think that like single private keys are the way that we are going to be kind of interacting with and kind of representing our identity to blockchain applications in the future. Uh, so like for, there is already a lot of work in kind of multi-signature wallet setups where you have multiple keys and then if you like one of them gets lost or stolen, then the other two can still recover it and replace it. Um, this uh, phone I have has this interest, this is the like, HTC blockchain phone, and it has this um, interesting kind of social recovery feature built into it where you can select five trusted contacts and your private key gets secret shared between them, and like any, if you lose your key, then any three out of five of them can just work together to recover the key. And like, I've tried the, recover, the recovery and it works, right? So that's, um, and so there are kind of things like that that people are working on, but in general, like I do think that for like, a big part of the potential of blockchains to be useful, like we do need working infra like, infrastructure for people to basically be able to, I mean, at the very least, kind of store like, and like maintain very long term and very robust persistent identities, and that's uh, and here by identity, like I don't mean you know like proving that someone is a human or a, or a citizen of something or whatever. I just mean proving that the agent here is the same as the agent at some point at some point in the past. And I think that problem does just kind of need to be uh, tackled head on and solved if we want to kind of ach achieve a big portion of the of uh, the value of the space. And the good news is that the space is also just providing a big incentive for people to uh, come up with and uh, try to actually execute on these solutions. And then the solutions could potentially be used in like other, uh, other contexts like self-sovereign login or whatever as well. So, but it is an experiment and it's definitely not clear like how user-friendly and, and secure we can uh, make these things at the same time. Yes. Uh, so I have a question. So you said you're making, so I haven't really paid attention mm -hmm. to this for a little while, but you said you're making Ethereum 2, mm -hmm. and I think you said it's a new blockchain, right? Um, yeah, it's a new blockchain with a kind of link to the existing blockchain, and so if you have coins on ETH1, you can kind of move them over onto ETH2. Okay, that was basically my question, because if you're continually making new blockchains... Yeah, no, we're, we're not having a new ICO. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yes? Mm-hmm. So if a 51% attack happens, um, is the blockchain totally compromised or can it recover? I think the fact that the Ethereum Classic price has not dropped to zero after it got attacked show, shows that yes, it can recover. Um, yes. Uh, so in it depends on the specific type of of uh, proof of stake. So the um, in the proof of stake that we're do, that we are doing, a smart contract cannot receive uh, mining rewards, basically because the um, like uh, the approach uh, that we have for kind of uh, ensuring the security of the platform basically requires on penalizing misbehavior, and penalizing misbehavior requires verifying signatures. Uh, and uh, kind of at some point in the future, which basically means that the process for verifying whether or not you per you actually uh, correct sign some message and needs um, uh, that's part of consensus needs to be a pure function, and that's just an inherent limitation. And so that already removes like very large classes of smart contracts. And then for efficiency reasons, we need to use like BLS aggregate signatures, which basically means that it's like. The only thing you can do is just 
either a single key or like a C or a secret shared key, and that's it. Um, yes. Okay, so our strategy for going to a post quantum has a few parts to it. So first of all, on the user side, for ETH2, we have a plan to implement what we call signature abstraction, which basically says that you can basically, as a user, use whatever signature scheme that you want. So the way this gets implemented is that you can think about it as the public key of an account is a piece of code, and a sig the piece of code takes as input the hash and a signature, it, uh, and it, the code executes, and the signature is valid if it returns true. So this basically means that you can on, uh, build on top of that, at least in the short term, elliptic curve signatures, or like uh, what, RSA, whatever other signatures, but in the long term, you could also just build, build on any of the uh, post-quantum schemes, including like hash-based, lattice-based, whatever. And there, we actually already have a uh, implementation of uh, WinterNet signature, uh, signatures inside of the, one of our signature abstraction proposals. Uh, the second part, though, is that for uh, the consensus um, algorithm, so we use hashes and Merkle trees everywhere, but hashes are already quantum safe, so that's fine. But then we also need to have these uh, BLS like, aggregated signatures so that you can aggregate like thousands of signatures and verify them very efficiently because we just have so many signatures from so many validators participating that you can't really, uh, it doesn't seem possible to avoid the, ne the need for aggregating. And so that's the reason why for the proof of stake consensus we're not doing abstraction, we're instead just <laughs> forcing everyone to use BLS. And BLS is an elliptic curve, so it's not quantum secure. But our plan is to rep um, eventually allow, like, implement a quantum secure scheme and give people the option of using one or the other. And eventually, uh, if, when quantum computers appear, retire the B uh, BLS. And in terms of candidates, the most realistic one seems to be doing a Stark on top of hash-based signatures. But this is still like, an active area of research. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> yes, I am Satoshi Nakamoto. No. Um, hmm, maybe let's like back row, yes. Hmm, it's so how is the arbiter appointed? Um, it, this depends on the context. Um, so there have been people who tried to attempt to do this. So like for example, there was this marketplace called Bitrated that was created about five years ago. And there they just had a kind of open market where anyone could uh, agree to be an arbiter. I mean you could also have services where the kind of creator and operator of the service is a central arbiter. So it's basically like either a central arbiter or this kind of open reputation based system. And one, or in some, you could possibly have like coin holders be an arbiter as well. I'm not sure, but like those are probably the main possibilities. Uh, 